Oh, I haven't seen a table I fixed it. So there we have this rapid calculator, um, which is one of the uh, few pinwheel calculators actually made in the US. Um, and ironically, I actually bought this from Canada. But anyway, um, it has this nice case like the Bruns Vigas, a uh, nice wooden base as well. So it'll release on this side just a pin to push in. This will come right off. I believe this was made from I think around 1919 up into the 1920s. Uh, you can see it's not in the best cosmetic shape, some of the paint's rubbed off here, but other than that, the carriage and everything else seems to be fine. Wood base is not bad either, most of the finish is still here except for uh, a few places. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the, um, the crank lock. Um, you can see from there, but it does not have the extra structure down here like most of the pinwheel calculators had where you pull the, the handle and it releases a pin um, from the structure down there to release the crank. It's actually locked right up in here and then the whole handle locks out just like that to release. So it does lock and the whole handle locks out to release it. Actually you can see the pin is right there. Uh, this has a tabulating carriage. The the feet don't have much rubber, um, rubberiness left, so they're harder than it slides, but I just tab over like that and enter some stuff in the input here, just whatever. Genius, you know. Tab over, enter random stuff in. It seems to work fairly well. So enter some random stuff, got something in all the digits here, except for that one, but that's fine. Um, so that all works fine. Uh, carriage, or not carriage, input clearing. That works fine. You can see that it just pushes this bar up and returns all those to home. Um, register clearing is done by these two points. That one clears out. We are missing a, looks like the ink came off the zero there. Um, however, the issue with this machine, you can see there are three positions that do not clear on the accumulator register. So that's gonna have to be addressed. Um, but other than that, the machine seems perfectly fine. Just only issue is those three digits do not clear. And it actually almost looks like someone's been manually cleaning that one for a while. You can see all, all the paints rubbed off around that one, almost like they tried to take their thumb and, which you actually can do, by the way. Oh, no, I went the wrong way. Now it's not gonna, it's not gonna go past nine because that's gonna affect the carry. So you have to push it over the carry trip. So that was the wrong way to go. But yeah, it seems like that's what someone was doing. Just clearing this with their thumb. There we go. Um, and she's a little bit worn there, so and not much worn there at all. So I'm guessing this one failed first, then probably that one, and then that one failed last. So um, I've never completely rebuilt one of these carriages on one of these pinwheel machines before, so it should be interesting. Um, it looks like it's going to be similar to how the Bruns Vigo works, where you can see how this pops out and then rotates around. So probably the way that this works is the shaft runs all the way through and then the shaft has little pins on it that will engage with a peg on the inside of the wheel. And when you turn the crank, it moves over to allow the pin to engage with um, the pin on the inside of the wheel. So hopefully it's the pin on the shaft that's broken and we can you know, drill out what's remaining there and put a new pin to go in there. Um, if it's the pin on the inside of the wheel, that's probably going to be a lot more difficult. Um, and as I see there's a pin that runs through this crank. We'll have to see if we can get that out, I'm assuming. It's probably not going to be particularly easy. There's another hole there. I'm not quite sure what that's for. But So uh, I guess the first thing I'll probably do is maybe I'll try tapping on this pin while it's in the machine just if something's you know, holding the carriage. Um, you know, that doesn't work, then I'll probably start taking this apart and take the carriage off and see if I can start taking the carriage apart and see if I can get the shaft out 
without taking that pin out, although I do not think that is likely. But we'll see. It doesn't look like a Tabor pin, so. Um, yeah, so I'll start working on that and see where we go from there. Alright, so I saw a miracle. This pin actually was fairly easy to remove. And it does look like a very slight taper, I think. It's kind of hard to tell. It's really hard to tell on this stupid camera won't focus. I think it's a very slight taper. Um, and I was able to get it out. I used my broken punch first, because um, that has the doesn't have a long spindly piece on it anymore, and I got it moving. And then I used my non-broken one to drive it all the way out. And this was just barely thin enough to get through that hole. Uh, so, definitely surprised by how easy that was. I was not expecting that to be that easy at all. So let's see if this will come off now. And it comes right off, how about that? Okay, well that's surprising. All right, so now I think I'm going to take the carriage off. Uh, looks like there's a stop right here, just like the Brunswick Vigo machines. Oops, and I need to hold this. I'm assuming there will be one on the other side as well. So it'll come off this side and I'll take it off the other side. So it's just a, a tab that screws on there to keep it from going past. So let's see if this will come off. Right, so let's see if there is a similar piece. This side, which there is, not surprising. Same way the Wings Vigo machines were built. Let's take this off this side. I think. Off the wrong screw for that. That. And now let's see. There we go. And that comes right out. And that's that is amazingly clean in there. Somebody must have had that off and cleaned this before because that is way too clean. You can see that down in that carriage bed. That is way too clean for approaching 100 years old. It's not 100 years old. So somebody's definitely been in there and cleaned that out. It's interesting. Kind of surprised they didn't try and fix it if they were in there and did that. Uh, anyway, so let's take a look at what we've got here on this side. So this on the bottom looks pretty similar to the Bunch Vega machines. This is a bit different. The Bunch Vegas have just a little tab and closer to the front. This one has a a longer tab in the middle. Um, not sure how many patents they licensed of Buenos Vega, or I guess Odin technically was the one who had the patents. Um, this looks also kind of similar to Buenos Vega as well. This is just a spring-loaded thing, so that can stay out of the way. Uh, let's see if we can take these screws out. And I might want to take the covers off too, because probably when I take that out, all these wheels are going to become loose, so I'll have to have the covers off to realign them, so yeah, let me look into taking the cover off of here and then maybe take taking this piece off the side. Alright, so I loosened up this screw and that screw and then the three screws on the top I took out and this has come loose now, so we can take that off, put that to the side. Um, so, not sure whether I'm going to have to take this whole side off or if this shaft will just slide out. Let's just try loosening up the screws on the end here in that middle plate. If we can. Yeah, I'm going to have to fight with that for a little bit. Not a lot harder than anticipated. You can see the shaft is out now. Just use this little drill bit to stick in the hole there since you can't really grab the end. Um, so I think I mentioned that the pin came out of this end pretty easy. Um, what did not come out so easy were the two screws holding this piece in here, which is the uh, shaft retainer. Uh, one of them came out after quite a bit of a fight and the other one I had to drill out. You can see where I drilled it out there. 
So I have to find a replacement for that, unfortunately. And then the, these real teeny tiny screws, these real teeny tiny things. I have to see what I can find for that. Um, and once that came out, then the shaft was a little bit difficult to get out. Um, you had to line up all of the wheels at zero. And then I rotated this around until the pins lined up with the slots and the wheels and then was able to wiggle it out and you can see our issue we have a broken one there and two broken ones there um, now these look like they're pins that go all the way through you know it's kind of hard to see right now let me get a tissue here um, but I think hopefully there are pins that go all the way through Otherwise, I don't know how I'm going to fix that. It's kind of hard to see because of this uh, scraping here. But I think there are pins. We'll have to see. Um, like a, yeah, you can just barely see right there next to my thumb. You can just barely see the outline of the back of the pin. So I'll have to see if I can drive out those two broken ones and then see what I can come up with to remanufacture them and drive them in and then see if it'll work and of course find a new screw for that. Um, see if I can get one of these out now. Looks like I can. A good opportunity to clean these. You can see how dirty that is there. That side's not too terrible on the bearing surface at least. See so there's the finger for tens carry. And you can see there's the slot that, that rides into. You can see how this works. See how it's kind of hollow inside? So normally, this would be something like that, where it can rotate freely on the shaft. And then when it's clearing time, the shaft moves over to engage with that and then rotates this. Um, and then when it gets back to zero, the crank handle pops back in. There's a little ramp. You can see here, there's this little ramp with a cutout here. When it gets back to zero, the crank drops into that uh, ditch there, which means that this shaft pops back into the middle and so it's free to rotate again. Um, so that's how that clearing works. Just drop that back in there. Um, pretty basic, pretty simple. Um, pretty much the same as the Bones Viva, really. Rosvika has pretty much the exact same setup, except instead of the crank, they have wing nuts. Um, but this, otherwise, everything else is the same. They have the same shaft with the pins um, that moves in and out. Um, Marchant was a little bit different in theirs. Instead of the shaft with the pins on it, they had a shaft with a groove in the middle of it. And they had an outer piece that had a row of holes with ball bearings in them. And that outer piece is what would rotate. So normally the holes would be lined up with the groove in the shaft. And so the ball bearings would be sitting down inside that groove. And then when you rotated the crank, the outer piece would rotate, causing the ball bearings to move up out of that shaft and then engage with the, um, the holes in the gears and move them all back to zero. Um, and something else that the merchant did that neither this nor the Bones Viga do is that it disengaged all of these um, detents, so it's a much lighter, smoother clearing action on the margin, um, at least the later ones. I'm not sure about the very first ones, but I'm talking about like the later, um, like the XL on those margins. Um, it released all of these detents so that it was a much nicer, smoother clearing operation versus on, like on this on the Bruns Vega, um, as you're clearing it, you're moving all the digits past the detents. So if you got like this whole register full, it's you know quite a bit of effort to move the, all the numbers at the same time past all their detents back to zero. Um, and it's even more of an effort on the early Bruns Vigas that were a little bit bigger than this, so you know all the springs are stronger and everything. But anyway, um, I'm definitely glad that the issue is here and not here because if these keyways here were shipped out, that would be a whole other matter altogether. I'm not even sure what I would do in that situation, but uh, hopefully we can come up with something for this. So let me first see what it's going to be like to try and drive these broken pins out. Um, 
and then we'll go from there. Oh, well, there we go. They're not perfect, but they're there. Um, more or less in the right spot. Um, I am going to enlarge them a little bit. Um, you know, it's okay that they're not perfectly in line because whatever pins I put in here, I'm going to have to profile to this shape anyway, so I can account for that slight misalignment there. Uh, I think it should be just fine. Um, the important part is that they're, you know, the distance between them is correct, which I believe that it is. You can see here faintly the track and the pins are right in the right in the middle of it. So I think we'll be okay there. Um, so as far as the slight misalignment, I think we'll be okay there too when we profile. Because here these are, you know, ground a certain way or filed or whatever. They're pointed on the top and they have this like cutout there at the bottom. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to use for pins yet, but whatever I do, I end up with, I'll, I'll have to profile it anyway, so I'll account for the slight misalignment when I do that. Should be fine. Um, I don't have a drill press or anything, so that's my excuse for not being able to drill straight. Anyway, um, I think we just might be able to save this. Um, definitely not, I was kind of hoping it'd be a little bit easier than this, but you know, obviously none of these pins would come out. I tried tapping on them for a while and got absolutely nowhere, so that's why I ended up drilling them. Um, whatever they did, you can see they're actually more of a line on the bottom, but like I said, that's not, not really an issue. We'll be able to account for that. Um, whatever they did to press these in, they were just not coming out. So um, anyway, next up we'll be finding something to put in there. Like I said, I might make these a little bit larger and put a larger pin in. And then obviously, you know, file it to the appropriate shape and the appropriate position. But we'll see. Um, I have to find out what to use for pins yet. Definitely, this one's definitely putting up a fight uh, between the screws that wouldn't come out. And there's actually two more screws on the bottom here. This one and this one that someone had already stripped out before I got there. And now they're two stripped out to get out. So I really don't want to drill those out too and then have to... Um, find some more screws, but anyway, um, I don't think this really has to come off. This this is the base just basically acts as the uh, bearing surface for the rails in here and also holds in the springs for these detents, but I don't think we really have to take that off. There's not really much in there to, that we need to get to. So find out some pins here and then we'll have to file them. So I started out with this rod, which is one eighth inch. Um, and from that, I made three little pins like this. Um, just kind of hand filed the focus. I mean, hand filed this end to the right shape and left the head as the eighth inch rod um, so that they will Start in the hole, kind of like that, and then I can tap them in and they shouldn't come back out. Um, you can see I've already got this one installed, and this one I've already installed and profiled. You can see it doesn't quite match exactly, but it uh, should be fine. And this one I actually ended up uh, soldering in um, because even though the top was a tight fit. I actually made the bottom portion of it a little bit too small, so it didn't really get tight till it was almost all the way in. So I just wanted to solder it to give it a little bit of extra reassurance. I don't think it would come out because, like I said, the top was pretty tight, but I just wanted to make sure. And so, with that profile, we can steal one of these and you'll see if I keep the shaft pushed over this way, this will rotate all the way around. Now it just fell into the, the hole there. But rotate all the way around, flip it back to that hole. Now if I pull it, pull it this way, you can see it hits against a little tab in there, and then we'll rotate the wheel. And then at this point, the crank would disengage and it would pop back over and be free again, and allow this wheel to rotate. 
Um, so I think I incorrectly described this before. I said that the pins pop into this groove to rotate the wheel, which is actually incorrect. Um, which you'll be able to see, but inside there, let's see from this side. See right there is a little pin. Right there. Right there is a little pin. And that is what these pins go onto. So um, when it wants to clear, this shaft will slide this way to get in the path of that pin and then rotate until it hits it, and then it will push the wheel until this shaft gets back to the um, resting position, at which point it will pop back over, which is controlled by this little lamp here on the, this is, this is sort of normal purposes, it's a uh, bearing for the end of the shaft. Um, it has a spring to push the shaft back over and it has the ramp that um, the crank, which I can find a crank here quickly. You can see the crank has a corresponding ramp. So normally these would be at rest like this, and then when you turn the handle, you can see that ramp pushes the crank over, which because this crank is pinned to the shaft, pulls the whole shaft over with it, and causes those pins to get, causes these pins to get pulled over and in line with the clearing pins um, on the inside of those wheels. And that's basically how it works. So it's a pretty simple mechanism, really. Um, just takes a bit of time to get these right. There's a lot of hand filing. Obviously, it would have been better to make these on a lathe, but I don't have a lathe, so suck with the uh, hand file for making them. Um, takes a while, but as you can see, I think they'll come out okay. My camera will cooperate. They're not, not perfect, but um, seems to be functional. Obviously, the real test will be when we get the whole thing back together, but um, if I'm going to profile this one next, uh, I think it'll be a little bit easier to profile this without that one installed, um, because if I put this one in, we're going to have uh, another, um, you know, fat head here next to that fat head. It's going to make it kind of hard to get the file in, but so I'll profile this and then install that and profile that. Um, and then I still have to finish drilling out the rest of the screw that wouldn't come out of the um, carriage frame. I have to do that before I reinstall this, but hopefully we can then reinstall this and test it out. So, um, so far so good, I think. It's just, like I said, just a lot of, a lot of work to get that to be right. Um, and kind of the nice thing about this too, doing this the hand file way is you can see that I made these sort of intentionally and sort of unintentionally so that the pin is offset kind of. You can see that the pin is not exactly in the center of the head, um, which works out well because my holes aren't exactly centered on where they're supposed to be. So I can install this pin in such a way, you know, I can rotate this around, which will move the head different locations relative to the hole. So I can get the head, um, you know, exactly on center where I need most of the meat to be to profile this into the right position. So, um, yeah, I think it'll work out okay. Okay, right, so I think I've got this installed for what I think is going to be the final test fit. Um, I got, just got this drill bit in here now in the pin, so in the hole, so I have something to grab onto. So this is in the resting position. You can see wheels are able to turn freely because I still have to clean and oil everything yet, but uh, they do turn. Um, the reasons I have the carry detents all the way back on, so they should be able to run past nine that way, and then we'll go past nine the other way. Yeah, so everything is fine there. That carry trip reset. Um, so, this is in the normal resting position. So how clearing would go is right now, um, this one should be at zero, yeah. So right now nothing should happen because they're all at zero. So this is going to 
rotate slightly and then extend. So I pulled it out and then rotate all the way around. And right there, that's the point where it lined up with the holes to slide out, so that's why I had to push it a little bit. But now it will be back home again and it should pop in. Normally there will be a spring in here that would push it back in, but I have that out for the moment so I can pull it out more easily. So let's set some of these. We'll set. Uh, so these ones here that I've marked with Sharpie, this one, this one, and this one, are the ones that were problematic. So we should be able to the wrong one. set those all to nine. And now when we activate this, you can see they're all turning now. Now we're back at the home position, so pause back in, and they clear just fine. Um, so I think that should be good for our fix there. Uh, like I said, I still have to clean all this up, so it's going to come back out again. Let me take this out, Oops. and then take out this screw here. I still have to finish drilling out the last piece of that screw yet. To show you how this comes out. So we take out this screw here. Camera focus is not playing nicely with this for some reason. Take out that screw and this will pull out. And then we have to Line up this shaft. That's why I can temporarily to line up this shaft. Should be right around. So this has to, there we go. So see how it popped? That means it's in line with those holes to slide out and it should ideally just slide right out. We're just gonna have it on camera. It's not gonna cooperate. We have it lined up. Yeah, you can see, I looked in the end, I can see it lined up. And it has to be when these are all at zero, um, because you can see, I'm not sure if you can see, there's a little metal spacer there that only will let it come out when they're at zero. Right, I'm just going to have to turn off the camera and then I'll probably just pull right out. What it's doing before. Not sure why it's going to be difficult now, but that should just pull right out of there. Not quite, quite understand why, as soon as I turn the camera on, it doesn't want to work, but. So I don't know what it was stuck on, but a little bit of wiggling and it pulled right out. Um, you can see our. Uh, pairs here. Um, there's one and there's the other two. This one ended up a little bit thin. Um, doing one of the test fits I found out that it was a little bit too long in one direction so I had to file it down. So what happened was when I made it I just didn't make it exactly in the center of the gap. So um, it'll be okay. You know these E10s aren't super strong so really should, there really shouldn't be a huge amount of stress on each individual pin. Um, to clear it. So, see the back side there. So, did a couple of test fits. Um, like on the first test fit, some of the wheels wouldn't rotate, like the pins were too wide and they were getting stuck on the internal pin even when this was supposed to be you know, disengaged and it was all the way over. Uh, so I do some filing there. Um, one of them would push the wheel a little bit past zero, so that meant that the back here was a little bit too 
far out, so I had to file that down and make it you know, in line with the rest of them. Um, but anyway, I think that came out okay. It seems to work. Um, so like I said, I still have to clean up um, all these pieces here. I'm not going to take this side out. You can see I've actually already reinstalled the crank on that side um, because it's really not necessary, I don't think. It would be nice to get in there and clean that, but I'm not gonna worry too much about it. Um, we'll just put, shoot some oil in from the top and I think it should be fine. Um, you know, these aren't, you know, super dirty. See, there's a little bit of, it's kind of shiny. There's a little, bit, a little bit of the old oil left on there. So they're not super dirty, but just because I have it apart, I'm gonna clean them. Um, but I'm not gonna worry about this. Uh, Cause even though I had the crank off here, both of these screws in the end plate are shipped out and I don't think it's really worth it to drill them out just to get this off for cleaning. I think it should be fine. So I'll clean this. Uh, I still have to drill out the end of the screw in there uh, that I drilled the head off to get that out. And then I think we should be ready to reassemble this and put the crank back on and should be done I think with the carriage repair at least. I'll have to do some cleaning on the uh, main machine mechanism but hopefully that'll be it for the carriage. All right, so I uh, drilled the stuck, rest of the stuck screw out of the side here. Um, kind of got some of the threads a little bit, but there's still a good amount of threads in there, so that should be fine. Um, and those screws are just to make sure that the piece that goes in there, um, this piece right here, doesn't rotate. They're not to hold it like in, really, unless you like yanked on the crank, like pulling the crank out, but you don't do that. Um, they're just to hold this from rotating because when this is in, the spring in here actually pinches the crank and the shaft around this. So the spring isn't trying to push this out. The spring is just um, kind of like pushing the crank against the outside of this because the crank is pinned to the shaft. And so um, it just makes it so that, you know, the crank is, basically pushed hard against here and then when you rotate the crank it just you know pulls the shaft into here but the crank is still pushing against the outside so it's not the spring never actually tries to push this out um, unless you literally pull the crank away from this face because normally the crank is always pushed up tight against the face of this either on the ramp or in the home position by that spring so those screws aren't actually providing any like, you know, they're not under any tension force, they're just twisting force, um, so that, you know, when the crank tries to go up this ramp, this whole piece doesn't rotate, this just stays still. So, uh, I should be fine, I'm not worried about that. Um, it's gotta find a screw to go in there, and that should be okay. Uh, like I said, there's still enough threads in there that the screw gets tight, so it's not, not gonna be any sort of problem. Uh, one thing that could be a problem, however, is if you look closely at the state of these pieces I've pulled out, you can see that that's not all grease. Some of these are actually rusty. Um, luckily, it looks like none of the bearing surfaces are rusty. You can see like the shiny parts where it's been actually, you know, rubbing. So um, I don't think I'm going to have any issue there. I'll just try and clean them up. Uh, unfortunately, there's some, also some rust on these pieces, which you can't, I mean, you can take them out, but uh, trying to put them back in is going to make you want to jump out the window. So, um, Basically, and the reason for that is they all, there's two shafts that hold these in. There's a shaft that runs to the top and a shaft here that runs to the bottom. Now I've already taken the bottom one out, cleaned it up and oiled everything. Um, this shaft is fine. Um, the top one is the problem. If you look, there's a little hole on the top of each of these pieces and that hole actually continues on the bottom side of the shaft. So that hole goes down to the Hole this way that the shaft goes through my in frame here. This hole goes down to and intersects the hole that's drilled this way, and it's the oblong hole, so these can rock back and forth like that. You can see they they're detented either position. Um, so there's an oblong hole that the shaft goes through so they can move back and forth on the shaft and they pivot on this shaft down here. And so that hole goes through, intersects the oblong hole for the shaft and then continues to the body of the piece 
and then underneath the shaft that goes through here is a spring and a little ball, um, or at least that's the center design, I'm assuming there's some variation of that, that provides the detent action. So if you pull the shaft out, all those springs then will pop up, and then you have to compress them again to get the shaft back through, which is not a fun experience. Um, I've I got so far, not on this machine, but on another machine, um, where I started pulling the shaft out, and as soon as I got past the first one and the spring popped out, I uh, realized that that was a mistake, and it took quite a while to get just that one back in. So we're doing all, what are the 18 of these usually? Yeah, 18 um, is not going to be a fun task. So since everything moves pretty free, like you can see these are all pretty nice and free. Like there's no you know rust drag or anything. So I don't think the rust is, like I guess I don't know any of the bearing surfaces. It's just kind of um, on the parts that don't get you know any action. So um, what I've done is I've cleaned this out the best that I could with everything in place. Like I said, I did take the shaft out to clean that independently. Um, and then I just soaked the entire thing with oil to prevent any more rust from forming, uh, which I think will be okay. You know, like I said, everything is working fine now. There's no sort of, rust is not causing any sort of functional issues right now. So I'm not gonna be worried about that. Um, just as long as we keep everything oiled up so that no more new rust forms, I think that's gonna be acceptable. And then the parts that I can clean up like these, I will um, clean up independently before putting them back in. And you can see this one is for the uh, counter register. This one. Oops. This one came out of right here. And these are just the detents. I won't go back in now because I have to push the spring down and slide it back in. Um, this would be a lot easier if I could get the bottom off because that's what holds all these springs and all these holes here are for springs that um, push these up to act as the detents. Uh, so this would be a lot easier if I get the bottom off, um, especially for these counter ones because I didn't take the shaft out. But again, um, before we got here, somebody's already stripped out this screw and this screw. And no matter what I do, I can't get them out. So it's just going to have to not come off. Um, I really don't want to have to drill those out and then find replacements for those too. So um, we can do it this way, it's just mildly inconvenient. Um, the best thing to do would be to take this shaft out, take the bottom off, and really get everything cleaned up. But you know, both the screws on this side are stripped out, there's two screws on the bottom that are stripped out. So, I mean, not that the threads are stripped out, but the heads are stripped out, so you can't, you can't take them out, um, which is annoying. But we'll just have to work around it. Um, you know, this register is, oh, I shouldn't have done that without that shaft then. But when the detents are working properly, this is pretty free, so not going to worry too much about that. Um, and then this is the shaft that goes through all of these detents. So it runs through from this side all the way through the holes in these detents and then through the holes in these detents to hold them in place. Um, that's why I can't rotate this right now because that, you can see the detents moving instead of clicking past. So I'll uh, show that once I got everything all back together. But everything seems pretty free. So uh, I don't think the rust is in anywhere that's going to cause a problem. Um, but like I guess for these pieces that I have already taken out, and I'll take all these out and clean them up as well, you know, just may as well do it while we have the opportunity. So I'll work on that. Um, you can see all the springs here that go in these holes, act as the detent operator. So um, I'll clean all that up and then hopefully we can move on to cleaning up the digit wheels. You see these don't look, don't look too bad really, just a light cleaning. Hopefully we'll take care of that. And then hopefully we'll be done with the register here, the whole carriage actually. So I'll have to clean up the tracks, but um, so you can see I've cleaned up these pieces. Uh, I ended up not spending as much time on these as I initially thought I would. Um, like I said, they rusted in the bearing surfaces and these are pretty complicated pieces, so it took a good deal of time to get every speck of rust off of them. And like I said, since I coated them in oil, I don't expect the rust to spread anymore anyway, so I don't think that that's going to be a big deal. Um, maybe evapor rust would have been an option, but these little spacers here, which are um, attached to these pieces, are actually brass. Um, I'm not sure 
you know, how that would work in Eval for us. Probably be fine, but uh, like I said, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. You know, these are all perfectly fine. Um, these I did clean up because the rust seemed like it might have been, you know, um, where these ride in these little brass uh, slots here. So, and they're pretty small, simple pieces, so I just went through and cleaned all those up. Um, kind of looking at that, I wonder how long it took them to make these um, brass cavity assemblies because, this, like, this is all one big brass piece here. This is not, you know, separate pieces. It's all one piece. You can see it's, um, you know, one solid piece across the bottom here with these three separate you know, towers, whatever you want to call them. And there's quite a few concentric, or not concentric, but holes that have to be in line here. Like this shaft goes all the way through. Um, the hole, This hole here, there's a hole here and a hole here. They'll have to be in line. Um, the holes for this shaft, they'll have to be in line. Um, and I mill out this groove to take this shaft. Um, let's drill all the screw holes. So I have to drill all the I'm not sure if they drilled those or they're just part of the casting. They might have cast those wide enough. They didn't have to drill them. I'm not exactly sure the holes for the springs that are down in there. But and there's another um, three holes for this shaft. This shaft runs all the way through to the other side. So yeah, kind of a complicated piece to make, really. It's all one big uh, brass piece. Um, you can see it was cast because, you know, right there they didn't face it. It's just the rough casting. Um, you can see the difference there between where they they milled here on the shiny part, and then next to that you can see it's the top piece is all the rough casting. They didn't mill that. Same with this piece here. You can see it's the rough casting on top, and they uh, face the front. Um, and of course, I guess I had to mill all these slots too. Those are, you know, too precision to be cast in. There's a little skinny slots there. So yeah, I wonder how long it took to make um, each of these brass, you know, carriage frames. You can see that piece actually, even down in there, um, is part of the same piece too. You can see the little hole there goes through to this base plate. So, you know, when you look down in there, you're not actually seeing the base plate. You just see more of that brass casting with just a little hole there you can kind of see through to the bottom and a little hole you can kind of see through to this bottom plate so kind of a, a big piece um it's like it uh, definitely would taking a lot of time to make that and of course there's some more uh, slots here on the back for i think this is the lock so that you can't clear it when the machine's in operation and i think this is the um, lock so either you can't shift the carriage or you can't move the machine when the carriage is not locked in, or both, possibly. So, yeah, definitely a uh, complicated piece there. Uh, so, so I've already got one of these back in. Um, see now, it's just a, a detent. So each time it, oops, now I'm right into my crank because that's not in the home position, but. Um, so I've got the crank partially turned so that it will sit flat on the table when I push it on, so. Just kind of started of running into that by turning the wheel, but anyway, um, put these back in and then move on to cleaning up the fidget wheels. So I got everything all back together here. Um, I do still have to clean up. See, I got a little extra oil on some of these fidget wheels, so I have to clean that up. Um, but um, everything's back together. The crank is on. So now, if I turn the crank, and I've got all these set to nine, um, that's where the window would line up. See, they all clear out. So I think that's a successful repair. Um, and I still have to clean these up yet. So I'll finish cleaning this up and then we'll move on to uh, looking into if this needs any cleaning. This seems to work fine. I mean, it feels pretty smooth. So I'm suspecting, hopefully we can just take this cover off and oil up the important parts and hopefully that'll be it for this one. So I thought it'd be easier to uh, clean it with it back installed, you know, so that the machine is holding it um, and it's not, you know, flopping all over the table. Uh, so, if we move this up, this is what attaches to the rod for the input clearing. I've got all nines set in, so I can add some nines, and you can see there's a little bit of oil running down, so I'm going to have to just pop down again, go through this multiple times to clean it up. All right, you can see. As in just fine, all the way across. 
and then clears out just fine. And if I do just like a one, should be one there, so that will add in one. So yeah, carries work just fine. But stiff, um, kind of got oil on my hands here, so I don't want to get it all over the crank, that's why I'm not holding it properly. But these machines generally work better if you give the crank a nice, uh, strong tone. Um, if you, you know, slow down or pause, sometimes they get hung up, like on the carry, like you just saw, they got hung up a little bit. Not too bad, that's just the way, you know, all these machines that I wrote down are just, that's the way they are. You just need to give it a nice, good, stiff crank, and it goes right through, but... Like I said, if you start slowing down or not going the same speed, um, sometimes it'll hang up a little bit. But anyway, um, so far, satisfied with that. And of course, this clears right out, no problem. Um, the zoom is actually pretty clean. Uh, you can see there's just a little bit of like dust on top of these uh, pinwheel uh, discs, you know, where the slots were in the case. But this is really not not dirty at all. If you, even if you look, you know, down there in the bottom of the, if I can get a good shot down there. You know, there's hardly any dirt or dust down there at all. It's really, really a clean machine. Um, if we hadn't had that register issue, the clearing issue, this video probably would have been like five minutes or something. Um, just, you know, light clean and oil, but I ended up being a, uh, not really a big project, just a time-consuming project. So anyway, I'll keep cleaning this up until, you know, no more oil shows up on these uh, wheels. I just, you know, put a little bit too much different places and each time you run it around, it picks up some water and brings it back up. So um, it's got to get all that cleaned out. But yeah, uh, so far I'm pretty satisfied. Um, and of course, these are all nice and smooth. So that'll just be a light, you know, clean the dust off the top and put some oil in and that'll be fine. Um, yeah, I'm really, really surprised by how clean this is. All right, so everything's all back together now. Um, you can see I cleaned up that one zero that was really dark. Uh, and I initially thought that, you know, the white section had fallen out, but it was actually just really dirty. Um, I found that uh, lacquer thinner, if you're very careful, you can actually use that on these type of digit wheels. I'm not exactly sure what kind of material this is. It's not like, it's not only like what the Monroe's use or the Marchants with like that hard white um, cellulose or whatever it is. It's not that. It almost seems to me like some kind of like, like hardened rubber. I'm not really sure. Um, but the same stuff that uh, Burroughs and Brunsviga and, you know, pretty much the, anything that's like a dark dial with the white or colored numbers. Um, seems like this is the same stuff, at least everything I've come across. And uh, it doesn't seem like it's a hard plastic. It almost seems like slightly softer. Um, not exactly sure what it is though, but anyway, so let's do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is correct, so that seems to work. You can say subtract 30. That seems to work. Um, clear this out. Of course, if we subtract one, carries over, and that's the end of the carry. And we can clear that out. Yep. But if we do that again, we can add one back. Like I said, you really have to. Give it a stiff, quick stiff crank. See how I stop there at the end. This machine is kind of interesting, the crank latch, you know, because when it's unlatched, you're holding it straight, which is kind of like the natural position you want to hold it in. Um, you know, with the other ones that you have to pull the crank out, it remains straight whether it's out or it's in. 
So, you know, both of them are a natural position. And sometimes, you know, when you're doing repeated operations, it's easy to, you know, let your hand release a little bit. And then the next time you come around, the pin hits the bracket. But this one, actually, it's almost, you know, too easy to keep going. So it's definitely, definitely, you, know, you wouldn't think that would make a difference, but it definitely feels different. Um, you have to consciously make sure that you stop and then release it versus all the other ones. It's, you know, you have to make sure you consciously keep going. So anyway, um, do a multiplication here. So we can do, let's do 625. And then we want to get five there. And of course, shift over. And there we go, 625 times 625 is 390.625. We can do a division, so we'll do 355. Divided by one, one, three. Bell didn't ring, might not be overflowing up. I think this, the bell should ring when we overflow, but um, because you're right at the end here, um, the carry probably isn't in line with the bell clapper. at nine now. That's not correct. Let's try this again. Ooh. Ooh, okay. Somehow this got set to nine. I have to keep my eye on that and see what caused that. Let's try this again. Do three fifty-five. One one three. So good there. Oh, right there. there we go. Yeah, that's up to nine. Okay. That's hmm. That's interesting. Set this to three. So there it stays at three. Let's try this once more. So this this column is okay. This column is okay. set to nine. So something must be catching that in this particular column. That's interesting. Okay, so I guess I'll have to take all the covers back off then and see what's catching this pin. Um, hmm. Also interesting to note, this means that this does not lock the pins while the machine's operating. So if you start turning the handle, you can still adjust the pins. Um, which is something that Brunswick did do. They have a, um, a shaft that runs through the center of the pinwheel shaft and that's stationary and it only has holes drilled in one place. Um, so when you rotate these, the, the, the detent for these actually springs out into that hole. So that means that when you rotate this off the home position, now you wouldn't be able to move these because the detent will just hit against the shaft instead of being able to fall into that hole. Um, but obviously this particular machine does not have that feature, um, which in this case might be a good thing because if it did, it probably would have jammed right there, um, whatever is catching on that. So not quite done yet. So the issue was, I'm not sure if you guys see this, but in between each of these gears here and the carry um, dog thing, what it calls the carry trip, see that little shoulder there? That's actually like a little washer 
and somehow the shoulder on that particular person, I don't know which one it was now, got bent over and so the pinwheel tab was catching on that. So I just bent it back over and it seems to be fine now. Uh, as far as the bell, it seems like we're missing something. Not sure else is going to be able to see this, but you can see the bell is over there and this is the trip but there's nothing that goes from this over to the bell. Um, and I tried looking under the bell to see maybe it goes down underneath the base plate and up inside the bell, but there's nothing coming up um, from underneath inside the bell either. So um, I guess they just got lost somewhere along the point, somewhere along the way rather. Um, so if you'll be able to see down in there. Um, I can't really get the camera to see what I wanted to show, but you can't really see, but down there and there there's like a a little a little tiny shiny spot, almost like maybe a screw broke off or a pin broke off or something. Um, and maybe that's what held a linkage that went from here to over there. Um, but yeah, I don't really see anything I can do about that. It seems like we're missing a piece, uh, the bell clapper, and I have no idea what that's supposed to look like, so, so we'll just have to survive without a bell. Um, as far as doing the math, it should work now, so I'll uh, put it back together and try again. Alright, let's try this again. So, go all the way over. Like I said, you're just not going to have a bell. Uh, there's something missing there, and I have no idea what it is. So, just have to live without it. Have to watch for you got a nine in the last position. It's quite fast enough, and it got a little bit sticky. It has a, a ratchet, so once you start the cycle, you can't go backwards. You have to complete the cycle and then go backwards. So if you start the cycle before you realize it's over for you have to do a, another cycle and then go back too. Um, just the way that it is. Like that, I started the cycle before I realized it overflows, so you have to go back too. We go 3.1415929201 um, I really like the decimal pointers on this these are really you know way overdone for a decimal pointer um, usually the decimal pointers on these on machines like this are just uh, stamped steel and then just have a little you know tab that sticks out the front um, and there'll be a, a stamp steel piece that's kind of folded into a box uh, that sits on here and then with a little tab that sticks out the front and oftentimes the little tabs break off but these things you have to break a, a whole lot more before you broke one of these off um you know, i think if you tried to break this off you'd end up pulling the whole rail out uh pretty nice i guess they're um machined brass and then plated i can see the kind of the, the plating wearing off there on that one um so that's nice uh yeah and of course the issue that we fixed if we Set all lines in here. Goes out just fine. Of course, on these machines, um, you know, the more digits you have to clear and the higher the numbers, the harder it is to clear because uh, when you clear it, you're basically pushing all these digits past their detents. So if you have all nines, you're pushing the entire register full of nines past all its detents uh, to get back to zero. Um, and on the pinwheel machine, the detents have to be 
you know, somewhat stronger because there's no sort of positive, um, you know, overshoot protection. The detents are your overshoot protection. So once it gets past the pins on the pinwheel, um, you know, if you're cranking this pretty fast and these wheels gain some momentum, um, you know, the only thing stopping them from, you know, overshoot, like if you enter, say, five, and you give this a quick crank, the only thing from keeping this wheel from spinning past five, you know, once it's disengaged from the pin section, uh, is the detents in this carriage here. So they have to be somewhat strong for that reason. Um, stronger than, you know, something like, uh, you know, like a Leibniz machine, you know, like the Frieden or Arithmometer or something like that, where the Leibniz shafts actually have sort of cutouts in them, um, which act as overshoot protection. So, you know, it's, there's a positive lock on the Leibniz shaft. So once the Leibniz shaft turns past the tooth section, basically locks the, you know, the digit drive shaft from turning anymore, um, which doesn't happen on the pinwheel machine. So your detents are your only safeguard against overshoot. So that's why I have to be somewhat stronger than like an thermometer based one like the Fruden where they can be pretty light um, they're just to make sure that the wheels don't move like when you move the carriage or anything or when they're not being driven um, because the overshoot is done by a different mechanism. So, um, yeah, uh, so that's, you know, on, the, on this one it's not too bad. You can give it a crank and it, it's not too bad to clear out the whole register four nines. On something like the Brunswick Model A, it's, you know, you're almost worried you're going to break something trying to clear the register. You know, when you've got full register and it's have to clear the whole thing out. It's pretty, pretty stiff. Um, but anyway, this one's not too bad. Uh, of course, on the Marchant machines, um, at least the later ones like the XL and the XLA, uh, they figured out that they could release the detents during clearing. So as soon as you start pulling the, the clearing crank, um, it pops all the detents down, uh, which leaves all these wheels free, then it's, you know, pretty easy to clear those out. Um, but um, that's the only pinwheel machine I've come across so far that does that, I think. Um, just uh, makes, it makes a big difference, but this one's not too bad. Anyway, um, let's go it for this one. Uh, it's called a success. We are working just fine. Everything clears out. Um, you know, of course, cosmetically not the best, but it's not terrible. Most of the numbers are still, you know, here and, you know, colored in. So that one's kind of missing, but... This could be repainted and, you know, refilled in. Looks like this was white originally. And of course you got your white and your red digits, but for now at least, uh, I'm gonna call this satisfactory. Um, definitely satisfied with the repair here. Um, so we'll just scroll all the way over. It's kind of interesting actually how many of these pinwheel machines use this little circular badge. I'm not sure if you can see, but notice in the middle of the rapid calculator it says made in USA in a circle. Um, and in that exact position is the same place where Odinu had his circular badge and Brunswika had the circular uh, Grime the Talisman Company logo. Um, I understand they all followed that same pattern of the circular logo right there. But anyway, uh, and put the lid back on here. Like that. And it does actually have a little handle on the side here, so. some cleaning but you can pull that out and then walk away with it so hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching